underway with our session today. I want to first of all welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us and taking time out of your day to join us. Um, it, my name is Jeff Beach and I'm with Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to just uh, cover a few housekeeping items around how we're running the session today. All of the participants are muted with the exception of the panelists and myself. And as I mentioned, for those of you that were online with us a few minutes ago, I mentioned that if you have live questions that you'd like to pose, we ask that you please use the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. And uh, we do that so that we can avoid background noise and distractions. Uh, I happen to be in a house just by myself today, but usually I have two kids here and being in this virtual world that we live in, I know all about the disruptions and distractions that happen with everyone being, or most people being at home. So if uh, so, this way we can minimize those uh, interruptions. Thank you again to everyone who submitted questions in advance of today's sessions. We had lots of questions come in, lots of really good questions. We will do our best to address them. And just to remind you as well that this is the latest in a series of COVID-19 Q&A Ask the Expert sessions that Cystic Fibrosis Canada has been hosting going back to April. We have recordings of all the previous Ask the Expert sessions and also the COVID-19 sessions that were held in French available for you to download and view if you visit our website at cysticfibrosis.ca. This session itself is also being recorded and will be post, posted rather for later uh, viewing within the next few days. So if you wanna go back and access it or if you'd like to share this with anyone um, else, you certainly would be welcome to do that once it's posted. I see a message uh, from Devin that there may be an issue with the audio. Are, are you hearing me okay or am I breaking up? No, you're good. good? Okay, maybe it's just on uh, Devin's connection then, that's good. The uh, impact obviously of COVID-19 has been huge and global in nature. And this has generated some very real and specific questions, particularly for people living with cystic fibrosis and their families and caregivers. So we've covered a fair amount of ground in the previous sessions. And we also have, uh, I'll just remind everyone that we also have uh, created a COVID-19 information uh, section on our website, information and support where you can access lots of resources that will be helpful as the situation unfolds and as you're managing your own health and that of your uh, children and family members who have CF. So just a reminder to avail yourself of the many resources that are available through our website, again, cysticfibrosis.ca. And I also will remind you that we have, not just around COVID, but around any questions and concerns that you may have about living with CF, or any questions about our organization, you can submit those to the email address advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca or call the toll free number that's on our website and someone will respond to you as quickly as possible. So please always keep that in mind, not just again, not just in the context of COVID-19, but in general. If you um, do have questions, I will remind for those that have just joined us, if you have questions, please submit them through the chat window. And for those that have submitted them in advance, we're gonna try and get through at least groupings and themes of as many questions as we can today. So my colleagues uh, and I welcome you to this session. Ian McIntosh is uh, the gentleman that you see uh, also on screen with us, who is our Director of Healthcare. Devin Sherman is uh, coordinating, providing the uh, IT support behind this to make sure everything runs smoothly. So thank you both gentlemen, and thanks to our other colleagues who promoted and helped prepare for our session here today. We are very fortunate to work with an outstanding team of clinicians right across Canada. And we're so grateful to have two of them here with us today to share their expertise and answer questions from the community. So at this point, I would like to introduce Dr. Melinda Solomon, who is the director of the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, and Annie Thomas Diceman, who is a social worker with the adult uh, clinic in Toronto at St. Michael's Hospital. So welcome to both of you. And I'll just start, and maybe we can start with you, Mindy, if you can just share a little bit about yourself uh, by way of introduction for those that don't know you. Sure. So as Jeff said, thanks for the invite, Jeff and Ian. Um, I am the have been the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic Director here at SickKids for almost 20 years. So have a strong commitment to the CF um, group 
And I've also been involved with lung transplant and I'm the medical director here for the pediatric part of the lung transplant program in Toronto. Um, so those are sort of my main roles and I'm very focused on that group of patients as well as training the new set of residents and fellows to come forward. I've been in Toronto for my whole career, except for a bit of time in Pittsburgh learning about lung transplant. And I look forward to your questions today in this time of uncertainty and anxiety. And hopefully this will help you make some decisions. Thanks again, Mindy. Annie? Uh, so my name is Annie, as uh, Jeff has introduced. And thanks again for the invite. And I do very much appreciate being here. Um, like Mindy, I've been working in the CF clinic for around 20 years and have been uh, primarily in the adult clinic the entire time. Um, these questions that are coming up today around school and work, these are very common conversations I'm having in my work and with my patients. Uh, so I think that this is very fortuitous having this at this time. So like Mindy, I hope that we can settle some questions and make people feel a little bit more at ease uh, in their decisions uh, moving forward. Great. Thanks, Annie. And uh, thanks again to both of you for joining us and sharing some of that expertise with us today. So these sessions, of course, are not designed to provide specific medical advice. Uh, we remind you that you should always consult with your own CF clinic physician and clinic team with questions regarding your own personal health care circumstances and that of the, um, in the case of parents, the children that you uh, that have cystic fibrosis that are your children. Uh, the main theme of this session, of course, in returning to school and work is quite complex and difficult, and as both of you have said, uncertain. And there are lots of uh, questions, um, obviously, for people living with CF and their families, but uh, in the general population as well, in terms of what should be, what's the best thing to do around these issues. So uh, it's important, I think, to note as we start this, uh, start launching into the questions and answers, that there are not necessarily clear black and white absolute right or wrong answers with many of these issues. And what we're hoping to do today is to provide some information from experts in the field that can help you and your families to make informed decisions uh, based on your own circumstances and your own level of comfort. So before we get into some of the questions specifically around school and, and work and returning to that sense of normalcy for many people, I thought we could just check in with both of you and maybe we'll start with uh, Mindy uh, in terms of how are things are going at your respective clinics, how your patients are doing and how you're managing your caseload in these evolving circumstances in the pandemic. Sure, thanks Jeff. So I can only speak towards uh, sick kids and our pediatric population, but what I can say is obviously it has changed over the last several months since March. As you all know, March was a bit of a sudden shutdown where we closed the PFT lab, we weren't running clinics, we were dealing with sort of emergency basis only. Um, things obviously have changed as we change the different phases and move towards more normalcy in terms of patient loads. Right now, I can just update the group, is we are running uh, CF clinics here at SickKids, our regular clinic slots, but we are not seeing everyone in person. At this point, we're probably around 50% of patients in-person visits and 50% uh, virtual visits, and that's what phase we're in at the hospital right now, so we're maintaining that kind of hybrid model. Our goal was um, to see patients that either were having a deterioration or symptomatic. We're still seeing obviously patients who are sick. Patients are still able to come through the emergency room department. And we're gradually ramping up on pulmonary function testing. Um, earlier during the emergency pandemic, we shut down the PFT lab. And now we're just slowly ramping up, putting in all the precautions. So I think what's different now is the timing between patients, the decreased number of patients and only doing essential testing. So some of those sort of annual testing we have decreased. Um, patients who are very well and are you know, not having a lot of symptoms are having more virtual visits, but we are open and we are available to our patients by phone or email or in basket. So I think in terms of availability, that's 100%, but the way we say, see patients has changed. And Annie, I, thank you, Mindy. And Annie, I remember from um, you when I posed this question of you the last time we had you on the session that it, it was uh, things were evolving, of course, at that time as well. Uh, would you say that you're managing things similarly to how uh, Mindy described it? 
Exactly. We would be doing almost exactly the same thing. Um, I think the biggest difference for us is our PFT lab got relocated to a new location uh, because they were finding that for um, the negative pressure rooms, they wanted to ensure that it was as safe as possible. And we're in an older hospital and there needed to be some ramping up to make it safer. And so that has happened. And now we're moving into that phase, like Mindy's saying, to make it uh, moving towards that 50% um, inpatient seeing in clinics. Okay, thank you both. Uh, so let's launch into some of the questions that we received over the last um, couple of weeks from the community. Um, and, and again, we've tried to select certain questions that are that reflect the general theme. So you may not, if you submitted questions, you may not hear your exact question, but hopefully we'll be able to cover the gist of what you were getting at. Uh, this question reads, my daughter is four and should be starting junior kindergarten in the fall. I'm apprehensive about her going to school. She has cystic fibrosis. And of course the direction for uh, grades three and under in uh, Ontario at least is that the children are not required to wear masks. Uh, the, this parent goes on to say her daughter is used to wearing a mask and will, but she's concerned about others not doing so. And of course the lack of physical distance and anybody that knows kids or has kids of that age knows that uh, they will touch each other, hug each other, sneeze on each other, cough on each other. Um, so what would you recommend in terms of children, especially at that early stage of you know, kindergarten through grade three, where there are some of these challenges and they may not understand the importance of physical distancing and so forth? And what would you recommend for a parent in that sort of circumstance? So I think it is a challenging age, this sort of early under grade four group is going to be different than the older kids who can regularly wear masks. I mean, our overall recommendation from the CF community, and I have been in touch with um, the clinic directors in pediatrics across the country, is that we, as an overall statement, are saying that we should encourage people to go back to school that we're following the public health recommendations in each province, which are different in various provinces. We're following, you know, Sick Kids came out with a statement from our CEO stating that school is open, but there are gonna be exceptions. I guess my first line would be that everyone's tolerance of risk is different and unique, and everyone has a unique experience in terms of what are the risks and benefits of going back to school. Overall, I, we are encouraging patients to go back to school, even for JK. I, if your child's able to wear a mask, I would let them go with a mask. I mean, I think CF is very different because our patients are much more comfortable with masks. And in a way, the schools are safer than they've ever been for our CF patients in sense of looking at kids trying to socially distance them, the cleaning in the school, the hand sanitizing that a lot of our CF parents were encouraging all along is now gonna be mandated. So even in JK, obviously, Jeff, as you said, they're not gonna be completely distanced the way you can do in high school. But I think at the same um, token, they are putting in measures to improve the safety in the school. So I would say your child can go to school in JK, not knowing their specific circumstances. And you would encourage the teachers to know that your child has CF and to be extra cautious. But I think even JK, they're doing their best to keep kids as separate as they can and as safe as they can. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the, one of the other um, details that this parent added in that particular question that I just read is that there, there are obviously financial impacts to homeschooling and um, the, the situation that we've been in so far, and that not all households can sustain the financial instability that COVID-19 has imposed. So even if the parent, uh, in some circumstances, parents may have the desire to um, or, or maybe have a, a less of a tolerance for risk as you've uh, suggested, but um, their financial situation or their family situation where they don't have others to help with caregiving and so forth, uh, they, out of necessity, they may have to uh, send their child back to school, even if they are very anxious about the risk. And I think um, the, the advice that you're sharing is that uh, we're, we're telling people to follow those guidelines and to be extra cautious in doing so. It is a um, tough time for those decisions. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you think uh, one of the one of the other questions that came in was around, uh, in this case, a, a child who's a bit older, a 13 year old, so uh, probably looking at around grade eight or so. 
Um, and uh, they were asking, it, does it really, in terms of that risk tolerance, I guess, does it depend on if you live in an area where there are few or no cases being reported now, or should there be a heightened sense of awareness if someone's in an area that has been flagged as a, a I guess, a hot spot for COVID? I mean, it's true. If, I mean, we live in Toronto and it's going to be different than some of the areas with very low community numbers. So there is, a, a, the risk is partially based on the prevalence in your community if you're a hot spot. But at the same time, those measures that are being put in place are across your province. So we're still going to do the social distancing. We're still mandating masks, the hand hygiene, the decreased numbers, if possible, in schools. So I think regardless of that, the measures that are being put in place are trying to keep the children as safe as possible, regardless of which community you're in. So for me, it wouldn't change sort of that in statement that you can go back to school with all those measures being put in place, recognizing the risk may be slightly higher in certain areas compared to other areas. Okay, uh, another question, and I noticed that uh, one question just came in live that sort of is reflected in some of the other questions we've received previously as well as around daycare. So yeah. would your uh, question for, for either of you, I guess, and Annie, I know you deal with the adult population, but when it comes to daycare, would you change your thinking or recommendations in terms of what people should be uh, aware of at this point? I guess it's back to what you were saying too, Jeff, about JK. Daycare is even another level of it's going to be very hard to keep those kids separate as toddlers. They're not going to be able to understand staying separate. They may or may not be able to wear a mask. But I would still say that the daycares are putting in place measures to keep kids safe. We know if we look across the country, there have been daycares open and we haven't seen huge outbreaks in all the daycares. There's been the odd exception and you have to look at those as, you know, sort of exceptions, not overall. I think if we'd seen a huge, you know, increase in numbers when daycare opened, we'd be at a different place right now making these decisions. But they have reduced the numbers, they have tried to, you know, clean on a different level, and to keep kids as separate as they can. So even for daycare, we have not said as a CF group, you know, you can't send them to because it's daycare, we have said, go ahead, check in with your daycare, make sure they're able to do the measures that are recommended. And if they are, go ahead and send your child with CF back to daycare. Great, thank you. One of the parents that wrote in had a, a bit of a different spin on things and saying, uh, and she asks, you know, am I, am I naive to be kind of excited for back to school and more than usual? Uh, because every year she's very anxious about uh, sending her children back to what she refers to as the Petri dish in school. And uh, this year it seems as though the, the circumstances actually flip things where she's actually feeling more comfortable and feeling like there are more protocols, it's almost like we've designed the school system to accommodate more for people with, for children with CF. And so for the first time, she doesn't feel like she has to show up on the first day with an armload of sanitizer and wipes for the classroom and so on. Um, she feels that they've got that covered. So uh, she, she says she almost feels guilty for, for not feeling as nervous as other parents of kids that don't have CF. Is there, is there some, um, any thinking around whether she, she is naive or, or would it actually um, in this circumstance be uh, uh, in, a, in a strange way a benefit to people living with cystic fibrosis? Yeah, I don't think you should feel naive at all. I think, you know, this is something that we've wanted for our, to protect our CF kids all along with the hand hygiene and separating them out. And they're used to being socially distanced from um, other kids who are sick or with CF. And so I think in a way she's absolutely correct. We are like getting what we kind of wanted for our CF patients all along. And I think it's okay to be happy to send your kids back to school. I think it's been a long haul having kids at home. I don't have toddlers at home. And to be honest, I can't imagine how you keep them entertained and then do, you know, some activities with them and try to work at the same time. And I know when we've been on Zoom calls, you see the odd toddler head kind of at the background or someone crying in the background. And I smile because these are the challenges that people have been facing for months. And so I think it's okay to be happy to say, hey, it's time for my kids to go back to school. There's social interactions that they're going to have at school that they wouldn't have at home. And, you know, again, it's deciding what's best for your family. But I think to be happy that your kids are going back to school and that you can either focus on work or go back to work yourself is great. Okay, 
Thank you. Um, we, we've had a, a few questions come in that around the fact that there's heightened awareness around respiratory symptoms now. So uh, I know uh, just uh, in my own circumstances, I, I was out somewhere a while ago and I, I had a mask on, but I started, I had a bit of a sneezing fit and I could see people kind of looking around and trying to avoid me. Uh, so when it comes to um, people with CF and children and adults with CF, obviously they are, um, they are going to be coughing and they're going to have respiratory symptoms on a regular basis. That's part of life with cystic fibrosis. So do you anticipate that, either of you anticipate that people will be um, sent home uh, from school or from work or require more frequent swabs? Or is, is there anything people can do, parents or uh, adults living with CF can do to uh, sort of circumvent that so that they're not constantly being flagged if they have those symptoms. It is going to be a challenge, especially with cold virus season coming around the corner as well. But I think it'll be important to communicate, at least for the schools, that the, telling them what their baseline symptoms are for their child so that people are aware of them and don't get worried when they see them, especially if they're not aware of your child having CF. I think at this point, it'll be important for them to know what their baseline symptoms are if they have it, so they're aware and they're not jumping on them and sending them home right away. Annie, I don't know if you wanna add from a adult perspective. Yeah, I would echo the same. So we're ensuring, well, we're not reaching out to every single student. It's more the issue of if students have reached out to us, we're very comfortable writing those letters. And it's not necessarily asking for accommodation. It's just putting on record information that is relevant to that person. And we also have lots of um, adults who are in a, in a work position that are doing the same type of thing, um, or even um, teachers that are going back into the work uh, the work atmosphere, the school atmosphere, and then being exposed to the children as well. So again, it's all just um, putting it on record. I think there's really the, the stance we're taking. Great. Thank you both. Shifting a bit now towards questions around the themes of uh, questions that were coming in from adults who have cystic fibrosis themselves and uh, who have children who are going back to school. So one question reads, my husband has CF and over the last seven years, He's landed in the hospital because of a lung infection, typically the result of a cold. Uh, the um, new school year is approaching, obviously, and uh, their daughter is, uh, thrives in school and is doesn't have CF, is really looking forward to going back to school. But um, the parents uh, are concerned that their daughter might be uh, contracting COVID and, bring, and passing it along, basically, to her father. So any, uh, any thoughts or suggestions on uh, how these parents should manage the situation? So from my perspective, we're taking the same um, message that Mindy has said to the parents of children with CF, to adults who have children who are returning to the, the school. We're saying that the, the school is doing what they can by following the guidelines set out by the government. And if this is in place, the risk should be low. Now, that being said, we have to look at every individual presentation of every patient and really see, is this something that is a riskier behavior for that particular person? And I think that is the one that's going to inform us as to how this person should act. But in general, we're taking the same um, message that uh, the kids is following out to their parents and their children. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that, Mindy? Yeah, I would just echo what Annie said, because we've had a lot of questions similar to that, either uh, with parents or with siblings would be the other one. And we're saying the siblings also can go back to school or the parents can go back to work as long as those measures are in place um, at their places of work as well. So that was actually the, the next grouping of questions that I was going to mention was around uh, siblings, a lot, of, a lot of questions, both uh, of siblings of children who have uh, ch children who have CF and their siblings and vice versa. Uh, and so I think the, you know, the general guidelines uh, around precautions and following those guidelines would apply yeah. for siblings as well. Yeah, we're not saying that siblings should stay home. And you know, there's families who've decided their child with CF is staying home um, and have made that decision. And then the question comes up, what about the siblings? Does the whole family need to stay right. home? And obviously, again, it's a personal decision, but as a CF group, we are not saying the siblings should stay home. Okay, thank you. 
so in terms of uh, parents of uh, children with cystic fibrosis who are now returning to the workforce, uh, one of the questions that came in was from um, a parent whose husband and she are both um, educators. They're both uh, working in the education system. One of them is a kindergarten teacher and they have a daughter with cystic fibrosis. So they're, they've already decided that they're not planning on sending their daughter to school. But uh, would you recommend in this circumstance, especially for the kindergarten teacher, whether they should try to seek work accommodations as well? So because we don't know the future, we don't know the impact of, of what we would do and how will it impact on our children in the future. We, we do tell people that if there's a possibility for remote work, then take that, take that route. Because it is safer, it, it's, an, it's more of a guarantee. Now, that being said, if we're talking a lot about what we've just talked about, if the, if the safety is there by following the guidelines, the risk should be low enough. But individual circumstances vary and we have to always think about the impact, not only on, on respiratory, uh, the respiratory um, impact, but uh, about mental health impact. Like we talked about the, the kids going back into the school, the teachers going back into the school, having a, having a, um, a workflow that's different than working from home. I, I think almost every teacher that I've spoken to about this remote learning, uh, remote teaching, it has not been the most enjoyable practice because people go into teaching because they want to be with the kids. And so a lot of that has been the discussion that we've been having. So it's, it's a weighing out on individual situations. Now for the safety risk, it seems low based on what we've been hearing today and what we've seen in the, in the you know, all government websites and all the information we've been seeing. But it's, it's, we really have to take it case by case and have a discussion individually. Uh, one of the questions that came in as well was uh, very specific, but I think will will resonate with others uh, in, in different circumstances as well. Um, and that is from someone who is a high, whose spouse actually is a high school teacher. Uh, and um, they are, uh, it doesn't, it, the question doesn't specify whether that person uh, who's posing the questions or her spouse has CF or whether they have a child with CF, but apparently they have um, been looking for an accommodation letter from your clinic, Annie, from the Toronto Adult Clinic. And, um, they uh, were told at, at the time that they were that the letters are being issued uh, that they weren't being issued yet because the clinic wanted to coordinate a, a consistent response to these requests. So now they're feeling a sense of urgency because the date for returning to school is fast approaching, and they're wondering um, when the various clinics will be issuing accommodation letters and what would those accommodations letters per perhaps say for the students and staff that are affected? So from my perspective, the way we have been approaching it is as people are reaching out to us, we are reviewing their individual situations. We're using the general guidelines that's set out by the government and then looking at their individual presentation and then having a discussion with the patients. Trying to decide is doing a hybrid of online learning and in-person learning appropriate? Is the risk low enough? If it's too great, then that's a decision that they and their families will decide on together. At no point in time are we saying to them, you must or mustn't do something. It's, it's very much looking at all of the information and then making the most informed decision that they can. Um, right now we will be posting something on our website, hopefully before the end of the week, the latest on Monday, but hopefully by the end of this week, it's just um, a statement that is really going to be echoing a lot of what's already out there when it comes to the CF Foundation in the States. So it's just using the Canadian guidelines a little bit more, but you know, ultimately, very much what Mindy was saying earlier, we want people to go back to school, we want them to do it safely as long as the guidelines are followed. Um, and for them to have um, options, if it's not safe enough, that once they, if they step out, what can they do as an alternative? Right. Uh, now, I, I understand that um, both of you obviously are, are based in Ontario and your uh, patients live in Ontario, but um, are you hearing uh, anything different from your colleagues in other clinics across the country and other provinces? Are, are, others approaching this differently or do you think it's a fairly consistent approach in terms of these recommendations around returning to school and work? 
I can speak on behalf of the PEDS group and I would say overall, we are all aligned in saying that um, we are saying to go back to school as long as these measures are taken. I think what's different is there's slightly different mandates from provincial government bodies about who's getting masked, when you need to be masked, how their schools are set up. So there are different measures and that might be appropriate because as you said, the prevalence is different in different areas. But overall, the sort of statement that with those measures in place, you are to go back to school if it's feasible and if your family decides it's the right thing for your family, um, we are encouraging that overall. So I think we're pretty consistent across the country. And I would echo that uh, from the adult and social work conversations that I've been having across the country have been very similar um, and very much talking to individuals, uh, individuals social workers and then talking to patients and then hearing stories from other colleagues, the conversations are the same, very much what Mindy said. It's going to be slightly different based on the province that they live in, um, but it is ultimately the same. Oh, the other thing I wanted to add before I run off is that um, CF Canada, like uh, Jeff, you've mentioned, there's lots of resources there. So be able to link back. CF Canada has put a compilation of literature related to each of the provinces. So it's a great place to go and look so that you can get a sense of what your province is doing. That's a great reminder. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> and uh, thanks both for your responses to the question so far. For those that maybe have joined us since we kicked off this session at uh, 12 noon Eastern time, we are he here today with um, Annie thomas Diceman from uh, who's a social worker with the Toronto Adult CF Clinic, and uh, Dr. Melinda Solomon, who is the clinic director at Sick Kids Hospital, the pediatric clinic. And we're very pleased to have both of them with us today to entertain questions and uh, provide some expertise around, particularly the themes of returning to school and returning to work. I will remind you, as Annie said, that we do have uh, a great uh, amount of resources and an entire section dedicated to COVID-19 on our website. So please avail yourself yourselves of those resources as you need to, and we'll continue to build those resources as the um, situation unfolds. I also want to remind everybody that we are offering these sessions in French. Uh, the next uh, French webinar is actually coming up on August the 25th at six o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we will feature two of our Francophone clinicians, Dr. Patrick Daniel and Dr. Andre Cantin. Uh, and uh, they will be uh, hosting a very similar session to what we're offering today around these same themes. So for those of you who uh, are uh, French or uh, have uh, friends or colleagues who you'd like to refer to, uh, please keep an eye on our social media and on our website for details. But again, that will be held on August 25th at six o'clock Eastern uh, time. So let's get back into some of the questions. And um, we talked uh, in some of the earlier sessions uh, in the early stages of the pandemic around testing and when people should be tested and so on. Uh, but I think it's, it bears asking, and we're still getting questions about uh, whether it's a child or an adult with CF, when they should be tested. Because again, they're in the normal course of baseline experiencing many different types of respiratory systems, to, uh, symptoms rather to begin with. So do you have any recommendations on when people should be concerned enough to actually seek out testing for COVID-19? So it is challenging in CF because we know a lot of patients have a baseline cough, for example. And I think that our sort of monitoring is, has it changed? So it's hard to say whether you have a pulmonary exacerbation that's due to your CF or whether you have COVID sometimes. But if you have fever, increased cough, new respiratory complaints, whether it's shortness of breath, wheezing or chest pain, we have gone ahead and had COVID testing done. Um, whether it's through one of the COVID testing sites or whether it's through the hospital, we have gone ahead with it knowing that many of those and most of them will not have COVID. But because we can't tell 100%, we're extra cautious. So we tend to get those patients tested. And I think that's the only way we're going to know. And September for sure is going to have some respiratory symptoms that aren't related to COVID, but we won't know. And so we will be encouraging testing if there's symptoms that could, you know, correlate with COVID. And that would be the same at our clinic. I, we recommend that our patients are calling and having an assessment with the, the nurses or with the physicians, because oftentimes it, it's um, something new 
but it may also be something old, like something just as part of their, their general presentation of their health versus, uh, versus COVID. But it's best for them to have a conversation with someone who has a knowledge of what their, of what their history has been um, to make a, a recommendation as to what they should do next. And Jeff, maybe I can just add one other thing. I think one of the other important things about going back to school is for people to be diligent with their sort of daily assessment of symptoms. So if, you know, before your child goes to school, I know what kind of chaos we used to have in the mornings before school, just adding that extra five minutes to just ask your child, you know, or if your child's younger, maybe just looking at your child, but just to get an idea if there's any new symptoms, we're gonna, I think that's gonna be a very important safety feature of going back to school is sort of that daily assessment. And if your child has new symptoms, whether you know they have CF or they're a sibling who doesn't have CF is being diligent and keeping them home. And I think that's gonna be one of the challenges of going back to school because now you've gone back to work, your child's gone back to school and now they have a fever or they have you know this increased cough, stuffy nose, and suddenly you can't go to work and they have to stay home. And that's gonna be hard. It's gonna be challenging for all of us. And, but I think it's gonna be a really important feature of keeping everyone safe. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of um, the, the concept of social bubbles, I think you know, most people have been very uh, aware of that and adhering to the concept of social bubbles. And so the question, a couple of questions have come in around once people are going back to school, back to work, uh, when they're coming in contact with other families that uh, are allowing their children to attend school in the case of those that aren't, uh, and is it implied that, let, let's say for example, if there's a family who decides that they are not returning to work and their child is not returning to school, but they have friends, neighbors, other family members whose children are attending school, should they go so far as to eliminate those people from their quote unquote social bubble? I would take the stance of yes, they should, because based on the recommendations that we've been hearing so far, the bubble is related to the ripple effect. And so if there is more contact with other people, then the guidelines are telling us that the safety is, it's not to say don't spend time with them, but it's about remaining distant and not doing the hugging and the kissing that you may have been allowing within this group of people. We want people to still spend time together, but just to do it as safely as possible. And particularly in these early days when we don't know what's going to happen in the first weeks to months. Um, and then hopefully over time that will shift and we'll have better recommend or different recommendations coming from the government. Thank you. And I would agree with what Annie said. We're saying similar things that, you know, the social bubbles of 10 only work if those 10 people have committed to that bubble, which will change when people go back to school and have their learning cohorts, if you want to call them that. Um, so I agree. I think September, October, we kind of have to go back to being a little bit more cautious with those bubbles. And again, like Annie said, you could still be, September's nice. You can still be outside and be distant and still see those people within your bubble, but just being extra cautious these first couple months until we see how this plays out. Yeah, absolutely. We've also had some questions coming in from young adults who are uh, in university and college and um, some in some cases living at home and having classes online. Um, so one of the questions was from a university student who has two siblings, younger siblings, one's in elementary school, one's in high school. Uh, they are going, both of their younger siblings are going back to their regular school routines in September. Uh, so this particular student, uh, who is, again, a university student, is asking if she would be better off living in her university town and living away from home, taking care of herself, or would it be better in her circumstance to stay at home uh, and, and learn uh, through distance learning as opposed to being on campus, um, knowing that her family members are going to be exposed to others at work and school anyways. So again, I think that's a hard decision because it's balancing sort of the social part of being home with your family versus safety and being completely isolated. Partly depends if is that university student going to residence to be away from their family? Are they going to a house with other people or are they living alone in an apartment? So again, it's going to be a risk benefit. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that question. Um, and it also depends on of how strict the siblings are going to be in terms of measures of safety when they go to school. So unfortunately, I don't think it's in our place to sort of say there's a right or wrong answer to that because it has several variables within it. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a complex um, situation with a lot of variables. And as we said at the beginning of the session, there isn't necessarily a definitive yes or no answer to some of these questions, but rather uh, people l m assessing their own risk and, and their tolerance for it and, and what they think is best in their circumstance. Uh, having said that, uh, and this, I guess, is, a, is another one of those um, non-black and white uh, answer questions, but uh, would, would you say, uh, what, what is the current thinking, I guess, from a CF perspective around people with CF who are uh, eating in, uh, want to eat indoors in restaurants or uh, do their own grocery shopping and be out in the community doing those things? Or I, I know at the beginning of this pandemic, we were all very, um, well, restaurants weren't open, so we didn't have the option of doing that. But as they've gradually opened, some people have continued to stay away from those circumstances. What do you think would be recommended in the case of people who are living with CF? So currently at our clinic, we have been recommending what the community has been sort of been advised of. So returning back into as normal a life situation as possible while still maintaining safety and being cautious. Now, jumping right back into the physical restaurants versus the patios, we're a little more reluctant just to go into the enclosed environments, which is a little bit like going into the grocery store. So again, moving back to if you can limit how often you can go or if other people can go, this would be advisable. But if you need to go, I wouldn't say you absolutely cannot go. And it's like Mindy said, these are these are very difficult questions that don't have right and wrongs. And I think it's about weighing it out. And if there's some confusion or concern about what may be best for your individual situation, then then call the clinic, speak to us, have a discussion with us, and we can help maybe advise you in a way that makes a little bit more sense or it has a little bit more information. We've had a few questions live coming in and Ian's been uh, feeding them to me. So if I look like, if I'm looking down, I'm, I'm glancing at my phone so I can see what those questions are. But um, one of the questions that came in is whether it would be worthwhile, this is an interesting perspective, would it be worthwhile delaying the child's return to school for the first couple of weeks uh, until we see if there is a spike? Because I think that's, a lot of people are anticipating that once the schools are reopened, there is going to be a spike and the schools may indeed be shut down um, rather quickly. So would it be worth uh, delaying that and sort of seeing how the situation plays out? I think overall, we are not saying to delay. We're saying the measure's in place, let's go back to school. But on the other hand, I have seen in my clinic, you know, talking to different parents, some people have made that decision to say they're not going back for a semester. I think to say a few weeks is going to be a problem because schools are obviously asking people to commit. Are you coming back or not? So they can look at their class sizes and distancing and set up schools. So I don't think the option is going to be there to say, okay, I'm going to do, stay home for two to three weeks and then show up at school because schools need planning time as well. But I know there are families who've decided they're not sending their child either for the first quarter of the semester if that's feasible or not till January and again that's a personal decision and I can respect that idea of saying I have the option of keeping my child home I'm not you know I don't need to go back to work or I work from home maybe that is feasible for some families but I think also you know I feel for the schools and the teachers it's like an unknown of how many kids are going to show up almost in September so a lot of schools are asking for a commitment so I think if you do decide that then be prepared to stay home till January theoretically if they're semestered. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. And, and again, we'll go back to the fact that for some families, it's, they just don't have the option of, of yeah. staying at home. Yeah, and I think that's why we're saying, I think overall, you, to go back to school makes sense at this point, recognizing, you know, it's not a zero risk going back to school, but it's not a zero risk being in the community either. So putting those two together, the advantage of the social interaction, the emotional development, the academic development, those are, you know, benefits of being in the classroom that we have to weigh as well. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come in uh, live during the session today is around uh, clinical markers. And uh, are there any sort of clinical markers that you would flag for um, either children uh, in terms of when they should not go back to school or uh, adults returning to work? 
So it is true there are some exceptions to our overall guidelines coming out of the clinics. And so, for example, if you're on the lung transplant list, you know, maybe we don't have a magic number for a PFT result, but I think patients, you know, uh, we're encouraging uh, children on the lung transplant list to stay home if they can and avoid school. Um, I think adults or children with lower FEV1s, multiple exacerbations, um, I think you need to talk to your clinic group and team and see what their recommendation is because those are the ones that might be exceptions um, with low lung function or concerns from that perspective. And I would agree. I don't think it's an absolute number. It's more of a, of a presentation. If people are having more difficulty, if they're having um, potentially more admissions into hospital or they're easily susceptible to getting sick or they have been in the past. So it's, those are pieces that we look as part of the presentation to, to advise someone whether staying at home is the, the better route. So as, we, uh, as the schools reopen and as people return to their workplaces in some circumstances, we're all hopeful that we won't see a spike, but um, there will be cases undoubtedly in some schools and some workplaces. So if there is a confirmed case of COVID-19 in a school or in a, work, in a workplace, would you recommend that that person, either, either the child be pulled out of the school immediately or that person not enter that workforce if it's possible, that workplace rather? So from, I can talk to the school part of this. The schools have already come up with plans for what they're going to do when that happens within their school. And the goal would be if you're within the cohort of the group that there's COVID, that's where the discussion will be about, you know, everybody may be sent home from that cohort and asked to isolate depending on the exposures. And I think that's why it's important that we keep track of these cohorts and keep our bubbles really small, because that's how they're going to decide who gets sent home. So we would go along with the school and the government plan and public health plan as to who's going to be sent home from a school. I do not think it's going to be there's one case of COVID, everyone in the school goes home because that's the whole purpose of keeping kids, you know, sort of cohorted together. So a small cohort may be sent home, may be quarantined or maybe asked to be tested. We'll see, you know, sort of how that plan comes together, but it wouldn't be, you know, there's one kid at school from a very big school who has COVID, that's it, everybody goes home. And I wouldn't, even if the child had CF, I wouldn't say you need to go home unless you're within that cohort. Right, thanks, thanks Mindy. And, and Annie, anything different to consider from a workplace perspective for adults? Um, I don't think it's very different. Now, the workplace has been, like, we've been having this discussion since the beginning because people have still been going into work in some situations. And so we've been having, you know, distancing within the workplace, creating some separated space within offices. And these are the pieces that if someone does develop COVID within that atmosphere, then it's all about who their direct contacts have been so similar. It's again, who have they been cohorting with? It's likely not going to be 15, 20, 30 people, but it may be a group of five people if people are following the guidelines that are being set out. Thank you. Uh, we've also had a few questions and I think it'd be interesting for everybody if you have any insights to share on the status of uh, people with CF with regard to COVID-19, uh, whether that be Canadian or global uh, statistics around um, how prevalent um, this has been and any information on the prognosis of people with CF who have been diagnosed with COVID-19? I don't have very specific numbers. We know it's relatively low numbers within CF. I mean, across the country, I haven't heard of any pediatric CF patients with COVID from what information we have available to us. Um, we know in the US there's been two known deaths that I'm aware of with uh, CF patients uh, with COVID. And one of them was post lung transplant and one of them had severe advanced lung disease. And those are the cases I'm aware of. There were some reports out of Europe and it wasn't showing that patients with CF did any worse with COVID than other patients. So, you know, as much as we were kind of very, very worried if you have CF and you get COVID, you know, how severe that scenario would be, but it really hasn't come out that way. And Annie, I don't know if you have anything to add from the adult perspective. No, it's exactly the same. I haven't heard any numbers myself. Now, that being said, I, I may not be um, privy to all the information um, of all the discussions amongst all the clinic clinics, um, but what I've known and what I've heard, what has been passed along is that there hasn't been any adult CF 
uh, people who have developed COVID um, and the presentation is very similar, milder symptoms for people who have gotten it, mostly um, American data that I'm thinking of um, and international, but nothing here in Canada, again, that I can call upon. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, questions around um, uh, the, the, um, the impact on the immune system of people being in isolation. So many people with CF have been in complete or near complete isolation now for quite some time. Uh, have, you, have you seen or heard any information around the potential effects on the immune system because of that isolation? So I haven't seen anything in journals specific to that in terms of, you know, laboratory data or anything like that. But what we would say is in CF, we know that they have a good solid immune system. They're not immunosuppressed if you have CF. Um, so yes, being, you know, isolated has prevented testing your immune system the way it usually is, but it hasn't changed your ability to mount an immune response. So from that perspective, I would not be worried that you're at more risk because you've been isolated. We, um, sorry, Annie, did you have something to add to that? I was going to actually just comment not so much around the immune response, but I find the conversations that I've been having with people is that uh, people are just more anxious about getting out into the community because they have been protecting themselves for all this time. And the worry that there will be a greater exposure and they may potentially get COVID. Now, all this information that we've been presenting today, hopefully will ease some of your minds around the prevalence and the ability to actually get COVID. But that anxiety piece is very, is very difficult to navigate because it's, it's, um, it's just, you've been doing this type of action and keeping yourself protected. And now we're asking you to do something very different, which we're telling you, it's most likely to keep you protected, but there's uncertainty around that. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a sense of, you know, people have sacrificed and, and really uh, worked hard to keep themselves safe and made accommodations uh, in many circumstances with their families. And now they're, they're, they're opening themselves up. So I think it's natural that people would be anxious around that. And, uh, as you said, hopefully the information that we're presenting and from what we're hearing from other experts in the field will help to ease some of those concerns. Exactly. In terms of masks, um, there were obviously in the early stages and some of the, the sessions that we had, like this one back in April, uh, there were a lot of questions about masks and what type of masks should be used and whether um, ki kids in particular wearing masks could actually um, make the situation worse, if you will, because they may be touching their masks all the time. And, and uh, so is there any change in the thinking around that, uh, around the use of masks? Uh, I'll start with children and then maybe we can comment on for adults as well. And, and any advice that you would give in terms of um, how people should use them and when and where? Yeah, it's a challenging question. There's so many masks out there. I was on the Amazon website last night and just kind of looking through to see if you could tell which is a good mask, which is not a good mask. And you really can't tell. They all look, you know, the surgical masks or non-clinical non ones are kind of blue. That's all you get and you can't really tell. So I don't think we have clear cut instructions on which mask is better. I think any mask is going to provide cloth or, you know, sort of the surgical type looking masks are going to provide that sort of droplets getting through. So we're not saying, at least at our center, this is the specific mask to use. Obviously the reusable makes sense going forward, but just remembering to actually wash them because I just laugh because some of the kids were telling me, yep, this is my mask. And I was like, when's the last time you washed it? Kind of like the same thing we say about, you know, boiling your nebulizers and things like that. When was the last time? So I think it's, it's another thing they'll have to do to keep track. So whether you decide disposable or reusable, the point is just to wear them. And you're right, the younger kids are touching their masks quite a bit and we're encouraging them to not, but even for adults, it's really hard to wear a mask all day. It's very hard not to touch. The good part is when you touch your mask, you're not actually touching your nose or face, which was the point of wearing the mask. So I think we're doing the best we can recognizing the younger you are, the harder it may be. And there's not much more other than we're talking to adults and we're asking them to follow these guidelines and, you know, hoping that they're following um, sort of the restrictions on touching their masks. But the, we're not advising it on any particular kind of mask. Um, we're probably leaning towards non-medical grade, like, again, not telling them a kind, but, you know, cloth, as long as there's a face covering, a 
its own kind. Ensure that it has two layers at least, whether it has a filter or not, that's entirely up to you. But it's, it's just ensuring that it does get cleaned in between um, to contain those droplets. Yes, and I'll, I'll note that uh, it was just flagged to me that Louise Taylor is uh, one of the, the participants uh, viewing, uh, participating in the session today. And she said, make sure that we mention that uh, masks should have two layers. And she says as well, you can spritz them with alcohol too. So there you go. See, Louise has retired, I don't know, but I think it was two years ago, but she hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> And, we, and we, we're grateful, trust me. We, we, that's exactly what we want. Absolutely. Um, so let's see, if, if there are any other questions. I, I, oh, we had some interesting questions come in as well around the uh, potential vaccine. And, and obviously it's something that we're all keeping an eye on and anticipating uh, will be available. But uh, the question is once the uh, vaccine is, is available, uh, would, individuals with CF and their families be prioritized to get it more quickly than the general population. Do you see that being a reality or not? You know, I have to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. We would hope because we're all biased and we want to protect the CF population. And I'm sure there's other groups that feel similarly, the immunosuppressed patients and, you know, other groups, but we don't actually know the answer to that yet. And is there any, uh, do either of you have any insight on the status of a vaccine? You know, you, we keep hearing about things in the news and, and what's going on in different countries and vaccine and the development and research around a vaccine. But do you have any credible information that you could share around where we are with this or what a timeline might look like? Yeah, we know there's the work that's going on, but uh, so far, not a source to tell us an actual timeline. We all want it to be sooner than later, but I have not heard personally any specific guidelines as to when it might come out. Not the same goes with me. I haven't heard anything further. Thanks. So we're getting, we're getting close to the end of our session today, but there's one more question that I wanted to try to sneak in. Uh, and this, this might be too specific uh, to have a, a response at this point, but I think it's worth asking around for those that are uh, with CF who are on modulator uh, therapies and whether there is any um, variation of the uh, response to COVID-19 if someone's on a modulator or not. I think the challenge for us is we haven't had many, like in PEDS, we haven't had any patients with COVID. So we have nothing to use as our denominator to determine whether the uh, patients on modulators or not have responded differently. So I don't think we have the numbers, fortunately, to even answer that question clearly. And I would say the same. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, any experience at all with any of our patients having COVID. I mean, there's been people, of course, that have come and gone from the hospital in the adult center, but none of our CF patients have. Of course, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it's, exactly. it's unfortunate in the, uh, in the, the clinical and, and um, research sense, but for people living with CF, obviously, that's the way we want to keep it. Okay, well, we are up against the clock and uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to, of course, thank both of you, Annie and Mindy, for joining us today. You were fantastic and were able to address so many questions and concerns that people from the CF community have been submitting and several of them submitting uh, live today during this session. So I wanna thank you both for giving of your time and sharing your expertise with us. Jeff, can I just add one thing to the end, if that's okay? Absolutely. I was just going to say, I think this is a very challenging time and I feel for everyone trying to make these decisions in a time of uncertainty. I just want to say your CF teams are here for you. If you have questions or want to have discussions, we're open to that. But I also wanted to say that obviously people are making decisions that are personal and based on their own, you know, experiences, what the risks and benefits are, whether it's going to school or going to work. And I think it's important that we all respect each other's decisions regarding this because they may not match what people are recommending. It may not match what you think is the best for your family. But I think, you know, we're a really strong community and I hope that everyone will sort of, you know, sort of realize that these decisions have been hard to come by and respect whatever each person has decided. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank you for getting that in this. Uh, and, and I guess Annie, I'll ask if you have any last uh, words before we close off as well. No, I, 
I would echo what Mindy just said. I feel like a lot of the conversations that I've been having have been very similar, where someone feels that they've been stuck and families have been protecting them and they're ready to stretch their wings and ready to do a little bit more, but not necessarily supported by the people around them, but not because of anything but love and worry. And it is important to look at all of these pieces together and that these decisions are very individualized. All we, we can do is have conversations to try and see what may be the best option for you and then what you decide is entirely up to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you both again. And just a couple of reminders as we close off, this session has been recorded and we will be uh, posting it for people to view and share later. And we have all of our other sessions recorded and available through our website cysticfibrosis.ca, as well as a, a, a great and growing uh, section of resources uh, specific to COVID-19. Uh, we are available anytime you need us by reaching out through our website, through the email adv advocacy at cysticfibrosis.ca. We have a, a toll-free number on our website that um, is available to you as well if you prefer to phone in. And uh, I'll put in a, a final reminder as well for the French session, which is happening on August 25th at six o'clock with Dr. Daniel and Dr. Kent Cantin from the uh, Francophone uh, CF community. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We uh, encourage you to continue to keep in touch with us throughout the pandemic for any support and information you need. Take care of yourselves and your families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.